It is my privilege, after that staring presentation by our Chancellor, to be presenting to you the keynote speaker for our convocation. He's trustee Jeff Mullen, who for the past 25 years has had broad experience working at the highest levels of transportation and redevelopment projects in the Commonwealth and in New England. As a member of a distinguished firm of Foley and Hodes administrative practice, he represents clients on a wide range of matters relating to real estate, transportation, construction, infrastructure development, and development broadly. In September of 2011, he returned to the firm after serving in the cabinet of Governor Deval Patrick as the first secretary and CEO of Massachusetts Department of Transportation and chair of the Massachusetts Port Authority's Board of Directors. Prior to his appointment as secretary in 200, 2009, he also served as undersecretary, general counsel and chief operating officer of the Executive Office of Transportation and later as the executive director of Massachusetts Term Point, Term Pike Authority. He was a principal architect of the law to create the Department of Transportation, a merger of the Commonwealth's surface transportation agencies, and as its first leader was responsible for the implementation of that historic initiative. I can't go into the range of details that accompanies its many activities, but I think I might be able to summarize it in suggesting that as the world moves increasingly to an urbanized habitat, his broad experiences make him almost unique as one to share with us the experiences of how our future may be plotted. We are proud to have him as a member of our Board of Trustees, a friend of the campus, and join me in welcoming him today, Trustee Jeff Mullen. Thank you, Provost. Students, faculty, Chancellor Motley, university administrators, distinguished guests, and friends of the University of Massachusetts, thank you for inviting me to speak with you this morning. I am honored to join you at the 2015 convocation. Let me offer a special thanks to Chancellor Motley and his team for all they do in such an enthusiastic way as we just saw for this campus and for our community. I see David Turkler and my friend Steffi Hartwell in the audience. They're those who are most responsible for my being here today. I also want to particularly point out and thank my good friend Dick Campbell for being here and for all he does for the university as a member of our board of trustees or your board of trustees. For those who are not aware, Dick and his wife have established the Crystal Campbell Scholarship in memory of Crystal who tragically lost her life in the marathon bombings. Dick is a tireless advocate for the university and for this campus, and is the chair of the current capital campaign that has raised $57 million to date. A round of applause for Dick Campbell. Thank you, Dick, for all that you do. Let me also point out and a public acknowledgement to student trustee Nolan O'Brien, who time and time again 
has done such a wonderful job representing the students of this university and this campus in particular. Thank you, Nolan, for what you do for the university. When I was asked to speak at this event, I was reminded of something that happened perhaps before you folks were even born, and that is the 1992 vice presidential debate between Admiral James Stockdale and then a United States Senator from Tennessee, Al Gore. Stockdale was, a, at that time, a decorated Navy Vice Admiral. He was a Vietnam vet, Medal of Honor winner, and a former prisoner of war. He, find himself on, he found himself on the ticket that year with an independent candidate, Ross Perot. And despite a lifetime of experience, at the time of the debate, he was new to politics and unknown to most of America. When he appeared on television that evening, his first words to those watching, words that defined and still define his introduction to much of America were, who am I? Why am I here? They were words that all these years later I recall as honest, humbling, and decidedly unpolitical, made at a time when Admiral Stockdale was involved in perhaps the most political event in the world. It occurred to me that when you received your invitation to this event, many of you might say, who is he? And why is he here? From the gracious introduction you heard from the provost, you know a little bit about who I am. I will get to why I'm here in my remarks, but what I really want to talk to you about today is to ask that you consider this morning, this academic year, and indeed to continually ask yourselves as you pursue the rest of your lives, is who are you? And why is it that you are here? Today we discuss the physical environment and human development. More specifically, I want to talk to you about your physical environment and your human development. They are, of course, related concepts that deserve discussion in a common dialogue. Both speak to the investments we choose to make. In the case of the physical environments, the investments include those made in our infrastructure and, best known to all of you, our campuses. In the case of human development, the investments are made in ourselves. And the investment choices we make in one impact the results in the other. That's because our choices, of course, are based on our values. In the case of our physical environment, the values we have as a community, and in the case of human development, the values we have as individuals. Rarely does any one choice for us, either as a community or as individuals, have a lifelong impact although sometimes that is the case. Those forks in the road, while memorable, are rare. More often, it is a series of decisions made over a long period of time, the arc of our lives, if you will, that shape who we are and where we are. It has been that way in my life and perhaps in yours as well. Understanding that, knowing when those forks in the road come, and staying true to your values when we consider the choices to be made is crucially important to the results that we realize. It is also that way in the business of transportation that I am in. And it is that way here at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. We therefore must be mindful of the values we and you specifically consider to consider the people that you are and the reasons that you are here. So who am, who am I? I'm a kid who grew up in a very nice middle-class family in a three-decker in Worcester. I was lucky enough to marry a fabulous woman and to have three terrific kids. I had the good fortune to have timed my birth at the precise time that it would, it would enable me to go to law school at night and to work on the big dig in the day. And to later join a fine law firm at just the right time that they needed somebody 
who happened to do what it is that I did. Looking back, it was a series of choices made when I was not much older than most of you that steered me in the direction of a career that brought me to be here with all of you this morning. I am not a scholar, nor am I an expert in sociology, psychology, anthropology, any other ology, or human development. Books and scholarly articles have been written on the connections between physical environment and human development. We know, for example, there is a strong correlation between the quality of housing stock and healthy development. That there's an entire body of science on the research and the impacts of the environment has on our youth. And it's been proven that the physical environment has an enormous and continual impact on human affairs. Well, I know all of that, and perhaps you do too. That's not what I'm going to speak to you about. What follows is a much more personal, and for me, hopefully, it, much more personal story for me, and hopefully for you, and it is why I join you this morning. You are lucky to be going to a school in a city that is achieving unprecedented success. In June of this year, it was selected as the most livable city in America by a panel of former mayors at the US Conference of Mayors. I know that many of you look around and see high housing prices, traffic that can be bad at times, and an MBTA that needs work. Indeed, the long arc of improvements to our physical environment is a work in progress. But let me assure you that the city of today is far better than the city of 40 years ago, when few would have dared suggest that Boston was the most livable city in America. Its rise and its attraction to residents, businesses, and investors today were fueled in large part by decisions that were made long ago. In my business, the best example of such an investment is the Big Dig. Those who recall the city before that project recall the South Boston waterfront of empty warehouses and abandoned rail railroad tracks, an airport that we could not access, and a downtown that featured a hulking expressway in poor condition that was clogged most of the day and that cut through the central downtown core. Today. Those same areas are the site of a new generation of workers in an innovation district, in a beautiful park that is increasingly becoming a destination for tourists, residents, workers, and families. And the entire region enjoys unprecedented access to Logan Airport. The Big Dig was born in the 1970s, a direct result of the People Before Highways movement that later impacted all of America and that resulted in a dramatic change in the way our large infrastructure projects are built. The result was a plan that emerged from the fork in the road that the Commonwealth and then Governor Sargent were in at that moment. That plan called for new MBTA transit facilities, a new highway, a replacement highway, and new parks and open spaces in key parts of the city. Completing the Big Dig was hard. It also featured an enormous budget, significant cost overruns, and controversial and questionable management decisions. But there is no denying the Big Dig's transformational impact on the city and on the region. The choices that people made all those years ago to invest in our community, choices based on core values of putting people before highways, transformed our city, making Boston a more livable place, giving us a modern highway system, a better transit system, and dramatically improving access to Logan Airport. While the Big Dig was all of that and more, it was really an investment in ourselves and in our future. We see evidence of that conclusion all around us today a time when people want to come to Boston and stay in Boston, when we see unprecedented growth 
in our knowledge-based economy and when the city has the highest concentration of people between 20 and 34 in the United States. More than 25 years after we began construction on the Big Dig, we formed the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. When I was asked what it was that MassDOT actually did, my experience with transportation investment permitted me to always answer that what MassDOT really did was invest in communities and bring people and goods together. And so it is with this campus. You attend a school that has been in recent years dominated by new construction and investment, long overdue, historic, and unprecedented construction and investment. I thought about how you must be feeling today as we begin this academic year. For the freshmen, you've never seen so much construction concentrated in so small a space. For the seniors, the construction had barely begun when you first arrived on campus. Now, it's hard for you to recall a campus without it. And it's everywhere. I'll have to admit that I laughed at the irony of the sign outside the bookstore, pardon our dust. It seems that no place is safe. I gather you all think that you will not be able to fully enjoy and take advantage of all this investment. For you, more construction might simply mean more detours, more traffic, more disruption, and less parking. It is, I expect, a hassle for all of you. But that's the wrong way to think about it. It's not correct because UMass Boston is, or recently was, at an institutional fork in the road. What you see going on outside these windows, not these windows, those windows, on this campus is not at its core a physical environment development strategy. It's a human development strategy. It's an investment in your academic success, in your life, and in the lives of those who come after you. At a meeting yesterday, Chancellor Motley urged the trustees to walk the campus, adding that he didn't care if our shoes got dirty. I did, and they did. And I didn't mind, and you shouldn't either. What you should do, indeed, what you must do is embrace all that this place has to offer. UMass Boston was created, as we all know, more than 50 years ago. It was founded with a mandate to provide a high quality, affordable education to Boston area students. It opened its doors at Park Square in 1965. At the 1966 convocation, Chancellor John Ryan said, we have an obligation to see that the opportunities we offer are indeed equal to the best that private schools have to offer. Indeed equal to the best that private schools have to offer. In time, some interpreted that statement to mean that UMass Boston would provide equal access for something less. More recently, many would replace the word equal with equal or exceed. And indeed, UMass Boston does exceed the best that private schools have to offer in several areas. But nonetheless, Chancellor Ryan's words made on that day, that convocation 49 years ago this fall, remain true today. And today's leaders, I assure you, are as committed to that mission as ever. But it's been a rocky road. The creation of this campus opened in 1974 was marked by scandal. In 1970, after a somewhat reluctant selection of a former dump at Columbia Point as the site of the campus, the Commonwealth hired the management firm of McKee, Berger, Mansueto to supervise its construction. As early as 1971, the media began to report that the MBA contract was a sweetheart deal with no competition, no negotiation, and a potential for conspiracy. The controversy in MBM dominated political news in the 1970s. Following the filing of legislation by then State Representative and current UMass Trustee Phil Johnston, 
a commission was formed. The Ward Commission spent two and a half years investigating the awarding of architectural and construction contracts in Massachusetts over the prior two decades. It issued its final report on December 31st, 1980, concluding that corruption was a way of life in the award of construction common contracts by the Commonwealth. Prominently featured in that report was the faulty construction of this campus. Ultimately, people went to jail, new state agencies were created, and careers were made and lost. The results were tragic for UMass. We had a well-sighted, poorly constructed campus that was able to attract little investment over a long period of time. That lack of investment also, of course, extended to our students in that they were denied the basic facilities they needed to learn and to grow. The situation read its nadir and the institution its fork in the road on July 19, 2006, when the campus closed the parking garage. It was time for a choice, time for a decision and time to draw on our values. The choice that university leaders made was one for the university's future and for your future. In October of that year, a master planning process began. Today, under the leadership of Tricia Philippone and her team at the Building Authority, there is more construction either in progress or being planned for this campus than in any one single place in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In addition to this fabulous campus center, the first new academic building in decades is open, and another is on its way, a project to install proper infrastructure around the ring road and out of its former location in the garage is underway, and we are working to secure the final approvals for the launch of the university's first residence hall. This central academic and human development strategy extends to creating a multi-prong approach to help students start on track and stay on track. That includes advising, and navigational coaching, planning tools, and early alert systems. The campus also has implemented initiatives aimed at building community engagement that includes learning communities and increasing opportunities for experiential learning, such as paid internships and co-curricular and leadership programs. I am here to tell you today that you owe it to yourselves and to those who made the decision to invest in all of you and to the people who are paying for those investments to take advantage of these tools and these programs as part of your own personal plan for success. Chancellor Motley told us yesterday that 50 years after its founding, the campus is getting younger. As a group, you are the youngest student body ever. You are the most talented students this school has ever had. Freshman and transfer retention rates and four and six year graduation rates are up. And the future of Boston's public research university is bright. In short, UMass Boston's campus is undergoing a transformation. And whether you all know it or not, it is you who are that transformation. So I ask again, who are you and why are you here? Are you someone who is willing to invest in the future, in your future? Are you willing to do that, to get your shoes dirty today, even if it's uncomfortable, messy, and sometimes hard? Are you willing to make the hard choices necessary to establish a strong foundation even if it requires that you stop what you had planned to do and rebuild something again? Do you have confidence in yourself to do so? If you are, welcome. You know why you are here, and I am certain that you will do just fine. If you aren't, I ask that you please rethink your positions. Like many of our transportation investments, the investments being made on this campus while impactful and long-lasting, are not really about the physical environment. 
Like those in transportation, they are the results of decisions made years ago by wise men and women committed to a mission centered on people. Like transportation, they are a work in progress. And like transportation, they take years, sometimes decades, to fully pay off. But they do pay off. And more importantly, they continue to pay off after the initial investments are made and they become annuities for all of us and for all of you long after the construction is over. They have for our transportation system and for this campus. They have for me, and giving time and effort, they will for you as well. I've been honored to spend time with you this morning. Thank you for listening to my remarks. Best of luck for the 2015 academic year. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. So great question. You know, so I, I'm a believer in um, uh, you do what you love, and then you never work a day in your life, right? People understand that. So when I was young, uh, growing up in Worcester, my father was the um, assistant register of deeds in Worcester County, and you know, he might as well have just been, you know, the, the king of England from my perspective. That was just a fabulous thing because. I had the opportunity to go to the Registry of Deeds with him on Saturday mornings and put the books away. And, um, you know, I'd look at the books and the deeds, and it was just like, this is very cool. And then what, he realized that I liked it, so he used to take me out and to Wachusett Reservoir and to show me, say, you know, you remember that deed you were looking at in that property in Clinton? Well, here's that, here's that land. And that's the stone wall that it said in the deed from Isaac, you know, Ichabod Crane to Chancellor Motley or whatever it was. And... Um, to me, so what, that's a long, long way of saying um, it came alive for me. So the environment was very alive at a young age, and that's when I decided that it would be very cool to be a lawyer, not because I cared a whole lot about Supreme Court precedent, but because the law is very alive. And, um, you know, it permitted me to get excited about important details like the width of a sidewalk. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I made a living at it. So uh, it's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, stringing together these uh, opportunities has enabled me to have this very fun career and, you know, hopefully along the way do a few good things. We'll see. It's not, not over yet. Sure is. One of the um, things that I hear a lot around campus, and you've had a chance to, uh, the trustee rides his bike over sometimes. Wrote it over to the board meeting yesterday, okay? And so lots of people tease me, and they call the road that's going around now our big dig. Yeah, mm. not quite that big, but big dig was very big. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Secondly, as you've done your assessment of what something like that, people say it was, it's a road chance. Why are you getting so excited about it, road? Roads lead to somewhere. Sure. Lots of times they lead to opportunity. Talk a little bit about, you know, this passion that you've gotten for the 
journey because you know what the end, the sort of end result of that is when you see projects like this. Like you said, you walk around and you get excited because you understand how it impacts people. So could you go a little deeper about that? Particularly, they could see the integrated science building hugging them. You see the copper on the building next door. Yeah. But roads sometimes, <laughs> that could be a mess, particularly when we're running into each other, literally, on the uh, road to two-way traffic and all that. So it's all outcome-based thinking, right? It's, it's all about, you know, uh, so when a uh, bridge collapsed in Minnesota over the Mississippi River, in the, uh, in the summer of 2007, Governor Patrick called our office and said, you know, do we have any bridges that are like that? And we did a quick search and, oh yeah, we got a couple, these are double trust, um, Dave may remember this, uh, double trust bridges. We had a couple of them over the turnpike. We formed a task force. We developed an accelerated bridge program. Start to repair this, I'm, I'm answering the question. I, I, believe me, I, I'm, I'm working on the answer. Um, we began to repair the Commonwealth's bridges, the structurally deficient bridges. And I remember having a conversation with the governor about what the project was really about. And it was around that time that we all began to realize that, you know, as a group, that it wasn't really about building bridges. It was about investing in communities and connecting people and moving people and goods. So it's outcome-based thinking. The new science center is bricks and mortar, but it's really a future scientific experiment that will result in a discovery that's going to change the world. And it's no different than a road. A road, without the road, you couldn't get from point A to point, I get all jazzed about this, right? Well, <laughs> point A to point B. And transportation is, if it's about nothing, it's about choice. It's about providing people good choices about how it is that they get around. So, last February, when it was, didn't stop snowing, and the MBTA shut down, we were completely paralyzed. Why were we paralyzed? Because people did not have the choice to take the T. So you can criticize and you can complain about the T all you want, but imagine life without the T. Mm. It's a bad life, Don't, it's terrible. Don't do that, right? So the choice we have to make is invest in the T because that's pro that, those provide us with more choices and more opportunities, oftentimes for the poorest among us and the people who lack other choices to get to work, to get to jobs, to get to family, and to do great things. So I always think about these investments as means to the ends, not ends in and of themselves. So that is why we chose to invest in you. And the road that you're on leads to some fabulous places. It leads to opportunity. Leads to leadership like that you see in our trustee today. I'm gonna ask one of our other trustees to come forward with me as we say thank you along with our dean um, to, what is the provost, come on up. Uh, you, have, you, have, you had a question, provost? I, I had a question for him. I, I, this is the um, most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I got it, Winston. Um, if response to this question occasions any uh, political difficulties, then uh, uh, you may refuse, but I, I wondered whether you would say something about the prospects for Boston and the region for uh, the type of transportation that will fuel its development um, now that the um, occurrence, namely the Olympic Games which had been planned for this area, have gone elsewhere. Are we going to be able to generate that sort of support that the city and the region may, uh, may have been expecting? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the first thing I should say is, you know, anybody who tells you that the old days were the good old days are lying in transportation. These are the good old days in transportation. And despite the fact that I will admit and be the first to admit that it is a work in progress, there has never been ever in the history of the Commonwealth more awareness of the importance of transportation to ourselves and to our economy. So from that perspective, I'm very bullish on it. But there are challenges. The first challenge is I see no revenue in the 
foreseeable future. And while there are concerns that we have a spending problem in state government, we have a billion and billion of dollar problem that is not going to be solved by thousands of dollars of solutions. That's not to say that we shouldn't seek those solutions. As uh, a boss of mine and Dave Mullen used to say, uh, Jim Carasiotis, you worry about the pennies and the dollars take care of themselves. I believe in that. But I also believe that you can't save a billion, you can't save the billions of dollars we need to provide the kind of system that uh, some would say we need, many would say we deserve, but I think, I think in the main, a lot of people say we, they want. Um, so that's the first problem. The second issue is uh, equity uh, that I think plagues our, our, our leadership and our thinking. And equity is an enormous problem in transportation in Massachusetts because we've got this east-west divide. Now I grew up in Worcester, so I know that, first of all, Worcester's not western mass, it's central mass. <laughs> and while I lived in Dorchester for years and now live in Milton and know that a lot of people think that the west is the Jamaica way, um, the West is Pittsfield, uh, North Adams, and David Cash from the Patrick administration, is, uh, who spent a lot of time out in uh, Western Mass, will tell us, uh, uh, it's a big state, and it's got a many, many variety of needs. So, Winston, uh, when you say solve Boston's transportation problems, I don't think we solve Boston's transportation problems without solving the Commonwealth's transportation problems. So, we need a statewide solution. We need, we need a revenue plan that will come, uh, by, and, and the way to get that is to stick, keep focus on our number one asset today, which is the public awareness that we've been able to generate. And what we need at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and in our system is trustees like the two men you see on this stage today. This young man right here has put lots of potentially billable hours in the make sure, into making sure that the notion of residential life for the only research university in the country of this magnitude that doesn't have it will come to fruition through creative ways of doing it that takes into consideration all of the values that we have as an institution. Hundreds of hours dedicated to that voluntarily. And we're so grateful to you uh, Trustee Mullen, I have on the stage with me now um, your colleague to present something, a token of our appreciation. That guarantee was under the um, value of whatever it is we're supposed to give as an institution. But it's priceless in terms of our love and thanks to you for all you do. I'm going to get on the other side of you. While we step out, you want us out here? We're okay right here? Okay. Priceless. Thank you all. And there is lunch in front of the Integrated Science Center. It's a barbecue. It's F-R-E-E. -E. <laughs> all you got to do is find your way there, and guess who will be serving you? your chancellor, and everybody else. So come on out and get something to eat. It's music. We're going to have some fun out there. And come on and enjoy yourself. I hope it's high tide. <laughs> Is it high tide? Is it a low tide around that side? But, but we'll see you over there. Thank you so much. <laughs>